In Genesis chapter 8, and we're going to look to verse 22, the setting of this verse is that the flood has just occurred, and God is communicating with Noah and telling him that things are going to be different. All right, in verse 22, he says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So God makes a declaration, as long as this earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. There will be cold and heat. And if you don't believe in the cold, there's parts of the country you could go and you will know. Right? Uh, Barry is actually from Minnesota. And uh, if you go to Minnesota, uh, you know it gets cold in Minnesota. Right? And so... Uh, it's not really where I want to be right now. I want to be in Las Vegas. How many are glad for Las Vegas weather? Beautiful weather. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so cold and heat. Well, in the summer, it'll heat up. Here, you know, it does heat up in the summer. If you don't believe in heat, come to Las Vegas. It'll make a believer out of you, I'm telling you. So there's cold and heat. There's cycles of uh, summer, winter, cold and heat, day and night, sun comes up every day. Even if it's a cloudy day, the sun still came up. You just didn't see so much of the results of it. But you saw some of it. It's daylight. So in your life and in our world, we have these natural laws and night, natural cycles that occur. And one of those cycles that is mentioned in this verse is uh, seed time and harvest. There is a natural a law of sowing and reaping. There is a natural law that if you plant a seed, then you're going to get a harvest. And so there is a result of the seed uh, that is sown. Now, God also made a promise. If you read the next chapter, you see that God made a promise that he would never flood the earth again with the flood. And, and uh, he said, I'll put a bow in the sky. And it's a be beautiful testimony of God's promise that the earth would never uh, be flooded this way again. And so God made that promise. Well, in the next chapter as well, in the first verse, after he says, seed time and harvest, and it says in first, the first verse of chapter 9, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's what he said to Adam and Eve, right? Be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth. So, so he wanted them to be fruitful and multiply. There is this natural law of uh, sowing and reaping. Uh, God originally put the trees in the earth and the plants in the earth, and, and it has the seed, the fruit has a seed within itself, all right? So there's always seed that is in that. God started the process by putting the plant world here, and he had a seed within it. So he started the process. We are simply to cooperate with the process. And by our cooperation, we get the benefit of it, or we get the harvest from it. So naturally, not too long ago, a few years ago, we uh, started a, a garden out here for our kids to actually know that things do grow. You don't just buy them in the grocery store. You don't just get it at Costco or Albertsons. You know, it doesn't just somehow appear. It actually grows somewhere. So they get an idea of uh, how this works. And uh, you could plant a garden in your backyard, or you could be a large farmer, couldn't you? <laughs> and in e either case, you understand the power, the principle of a seed. You understand the principle of sowing and reaping as a result, and you get a harvest that is a reward of your sowing and your labor. All right, so... In this case, he tells them, replenish the earth, be fruitful, multiply. He told Adam the same thing. So, and Adam, he, he, God created man in his own image, in the likeness of God created he him, male and female created he them. And he said unto them, be fruitful, and what? Multiply, and replenish, or fill the earth. So, you, then you have this responsibility that was given to you by God to do something with what he has given all right, so God has given us that responsibility in a natural way, in a natural 
uh, life that we live, we labor, even Adam, he said, I, I'm putting you in this garden. He put him in the garden. He said, now, I want you to dress it and to keep it. I want you to take care of it. In other words, you work the garden. So God created man to work and labor. Labor working with your hands that you may have to give, not only to eat, not only to have a provision for your family, but that you should give as well as live. So God gives seed to the sower in the uh, New Testament. It says God gives seed to the sower and what? Bread for your food, and then he multiplies your seed sown. So he gives you both seed to sow and bread to eat. So he's taking care of your need for your own family, your own personal uh, needs, but he also gives you seed that you are to sow. So some money that you receive in your life is seed money, and some money that you receive in your life is bread money. And you can determine how much of it is seed, and you can determine how much of it is for bread or for your own consumption and for your own uh, pleasure or enjoyment uh, or uh, blessing in your life. So you can decide when it comes to tithe, God's already decreed a tithe. All the tithe is the Lord's. 10% belongs to God. So there's no decision that I have to make except to obey in that regard. But when it comes to offering anything above the tithe, it's something that I do and I purpose in my heart to do and I choose to do. And you can choose and you can decide how much of your money is seed money. And how much of your money is bread money? Does that make sense? Now, God cannot and uh, will not multiply your bread money in the sense of, in other words, if you eat it, it doesn't multiply, except you, you did that. You may have increased, but, you know, you did that. God didn't do that. You did that. All right, so... But when you sow your seed, God has committed himself to multiply it. Now, he said be fruitful to them. They had a responsibility. Naturally, they had a responsibility to be fruitful. Both Noah and his sons and also Adam and Eve had a responsibility to be fruitful and multiply because that was God's command to them, right? So now, we have a responsibility in the spiritual sense and uh, as far as natural sense, we have a responsibility to work and labor with our hands, right, that we may have to give. A and we have that responsibility, but we also have a responsibility to sow our seed, labor, working with your hands that you may have to give. So then, if you uh, choose to give and sow your seed, so we're going to go to the New Testament now and look at a passage in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 9. Both chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians is talking about the subject of sowing and reaping or giving. And very, they had a very specific, Paul had given them specific directions regarding their giving. And he also gave them specific promises uh, regarding uh, their receiving as well. And so in this particular two chapters, he talks about... Redemption and your redemptive right to prosperity and blessing and riches. Because Jesus was made poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. So he talks about your redemptive right to this. But he also tells you the practical side. Because you can know the redemptive right and not apply the practical side. And not enjoy the redemptive privilege. Would you follow me? So he gives them not only the. The redemptive right, and because of what Jesus has done, but he's given them the practical application of how to do it. So primarily what we're going to uh, focus on today is the practical application. Uh, the Word of God was meant to be acted upon. All right, so in this passage, in verse uh, 6 of chapter 9, he's still talking about this subject. And so in verse 6, he says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So he talks about uh, different types of sowing. And he tells you that your sowing determines your harvest, doesn't he? He said, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap a sparing harvest. If you sow... Uh, in this way, 
the word that he uses in the King James Version, bountifully. If you sow bountifully, you're going to reap what kind of harvest? You're going to get a, a bountiful harvest. Now, uh, Barclay says, meager sowing, uh, meager reaping. Meager sowing means meager reaping. Uh, Jordan's very uh, straightforward translation says, a stingy sower gathers a stingy harvest. And then uh, another 20th century says, scanty sowing, scanty harvest. Plentiful sowing, plentiful harvest. So then in each case, of course, these are different translations. Good News Bible says, remember the person who plants a few seeds will have a small crop. The one who plants many seeds will have a large crop. So in this natural law of uh, sowing and reaping, And then now in this spiritual law, this is actually a spiritual law here. You're doing it naturally. You're giving your resources, but it is a spiritual law that if you sow, uh, God says you shall reap. Whatever, Galatians uh, 6 says, whatever a man sows, then that means whatever. That means whatever you sow. It would be an all-inclusive verse. It's a really powerful, uh, uh, takes into it a lot of application, but The basic principle that whatever you sow, you shall reap. So if you sow financially into God's kingdom, he says that you're going to reap finances or blessing as a result of your sowing. And Paul is talking specifically in this case about financial sowing. And he says there is a spiritual law involved here that if you sow your seed, you're going to reap a harvest based on the uh, proportion of your sowing. The type of sowing determines the type of harvest. You sow a few seeds, you get a little harvest. I mean, you can sow a tomato seed and you have a little tomato plant in your backyard. You can eat tomatoes in the summer. And that's great. Uh, but you're not going to feed the world. Right? Uh, you can sow a few squash seeds. You're going to eat some squash for yourself, your personal consumption. You enjoyed it. It's great. It's wonderful. But you're not feeding the world. Nobody's going to Albertsons to buy your squash. Right. Nobody's going to Smith's to buy, I want to be equal opportunity here, Smith's to buy buy your squash. No, so uh, you're doing that for your personal benefit. But someone who is going to supply uh, the society or supply the world with provision, there's going to have to be some larger mindset. There's going to have to be a larger uh, a thinking, a enlargement of their perception of what is important and their investment. What are they going to do with their life, their time, their money, their resources? What are they going to do? So uh, if you're going to help feed the world, you're going to have to have a larger crop. So as a Christian, we're not just trying to eat our squash and eat our tomatoes from our little vines in the backyard. No, we're trying to supply the world with the gospel. So we got to have a bigger mentality and think outside of our little box of our own little lives that we're trying to eat my squash, and it's good, it's fresh, it's nice. But what about the neighbor, and what about the city, and what about the state, and what about the nation, and what about the world? What are they going to eat when it comes to the gospel? So then we have the responsibility to think larger in our mindset, our thinking. We want to have a larger view of the way God wants us to farm, if you will. And so uh, in this case, he says, if you sow sparingly, you're going to have a sparing harvest, which means that you sowed a little bit and you, you just had a little bit. But if you sow larger seeds... Then in more seeds, in the sense of you sow more seeds, and you're going to have a plentiful harvest, a greater harvest. So that means you got more resources for sowing, and you got more to enjoy for your own personal blessing. So God wants you to have both uh, involved there. He wants you to have a greater blessing for your own personal life, but He wants you to really think outside of yourself. And he wants you to live for more than you, your for, no more. He wants you to live with a mentality and a thinking that there's a whole world that needs the gospel and somebody's got to finance it. Somebody's got to believe in it. Somebody's got to invest in it in order for that to actually occur for the gospel. You know, the gospel is free because Jesus has paid the price for the gospel to go to the whole world. But somebody's got to pay for it to go. 
right? Somebody's got to finance it actually going. Somebody's got to finance the, the gospel to this city. Somebody's got to build the building. Somebody's got to pay for the land. Somebody's got to pay for the television time. Somebody's got to uh, pay for the food that we give to the homeless. Or somebody's got to pay in order for it to actually get to the places it needs to go. Somebody's got to support the missionary that's going to the world. Somebody's got to give in order for their needs to be taken care of so that they can can carry the gospel to the nations of the world. So somewhere we have to have a larger mentality than just you, me, my four, no more. We got to have a mentality that God wants us to be a large farmer. Hallelujah. Because we got a big job to do and we got to feed the world. So he said, if you sow uh, sparingly, you're going to get a sparing harvest. You sow generously or you sow uh, bountifully, and other translations actually say generously. If you sow generously, then you're going to get a generous harvest. All right. So generosity is relative. In other words, generosity uh, is in one person's life could be different from what it would be in another person's life because it's accepted according to man, what a man has and not according to what he doesn't have. So therefore, anyone can be generous. At any level, financially, anyone and everyone can be generous. You can be generous with a small amount, and you can be generous with a large amount. So, we see the woman who had uh, given simply in the Bible two mites, very, very minimal amount of resource, but she gave it, and Jesus watched her gave. You know, it's interesting, Jesus watched it offering time. He still does, if you didn't know. Because actually it says in Hebrews that there he receives your tithe. In other words, he receives your offering. It's not just the church receiving your offering. He's receiving your tithe. He's receiving your offering. So he was watching the offering, and he saw all these people give. And then he saw this one. They gave out of their abundance. They had all the uh, resources. But she comes along. She gives two mites, very small amount of money. But it says that she gave all. Wow. So she gave, and Jesus says she gave more than they all. So it wasn't, generosity is not necessarily determined by the amount. It's determined by the amount you have left after you gave. I said it's determined by the amount you have left after you gave because your generosity is proportional to what you have. So then anybody can be generous at any time in their life. And I've found that people that learn to be generous when they have little, God sees their faithfulness and their generosity, and he increases it more and more. And at every level, if you'll pass the test, at every level of your prosperity and blessing, if you'll pass the test and maintain generosity throughout your life, then God's blessing will be on your life at every season of your life. Hallelujah. And there is no limit to what God can do. Now, the next verse says, every man or woman or person, every man or woman or person, according as he or she purposes in their heart, so let him give, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loves, what? A cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. All right, so he says, every person has a purpose in their heart, so giving then would be purposeful. You give on purpose. No one ties by chance. Nobody just showed up today and said, ha, huh, tithe. It's offering time. No, they planned, they purposed, and they made a decision, and they followed through with that decision. It didn't just happen. It happened because they purposed in their heart to give, and they made a decision to do it, and they followed through and obeyed God's word. People don't just Give, they purpose to give. They make a choice. Actually, Amplified says you made up your own mind. So you choose to do. You purpose to give. And when you purpose in your heart to give, he says, as a man purposes, a person purposes in their heart, so let him give. And then he says, don't do it grudgingly or wishing you could keep it or as though it was squeezed out of you. Right? 
Don't do it that way. He says, don't do it uh, grudgingly or wishing you could keep it or hold on to it. He said, uh, or, or out of necessity. In other words, uh, uh, this church is not going to make it if you don't. No, we will make it if you don't. I don't know about you if you'll make it, but we will make it. Because your seed determines your harvest, and our seed determines our harvest. $596,000 is a seed, so there's got to be a harvest. I said, that's a seed, so there's got to be a harvest. So this church will make it because this church is sowing seed. And if you sow your seed, your seed determines your harvest. My seed determines my harvest. You can't judge a person by what they possess. You can't judge a church by what they possess. Some people have said, you go over to that rich church. Well, I qualify. Hallelujah. (laughs) Some people have said to you. You go to that rich church. Well, that's a good, that's a good thing. Who wants to go to a broke church so we can all be broke together? I don't want to go to a broke church and we all broke together. No, I want to be blessed. I want to go to a blessed church, and I want you blessed and your house blessed and your family blessed and your kids blessed and your future blessed because God wants you blessed. So, if they accuse us of that, we're fulfilling the Bible. Thank you, Jesus. Now, we're glad to be richer because we can do a whole lot more for Jesus Christ. We can reach further in the world with the gospel of Christ. The more money we have, thank you, Jesus, the more we can do for the kingdom of God. We don't want limited resources to limit the will of God and the plan of God, so we need the money in order to do His will. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. So don't let people intimidate you about being blessed. No. You be bold and strong that God has given you a mandate from heaven to be generous. Hallelujah. And he said... In this verse, you purpose in your heart. In other words, you can decide to be a big farmer. All right, so consider. Farmers, you know, in our society today in the United States, most small farmers have been pretty much pushed out of business. Large farmers, and I'm not saying that's the best in all cases. I'm just saying that's what's happened, okay? Large farmers have basically bought up the lands, bought up the small farms, Why? Because as a small farmer, you can't compete with a large farmer because he's got a, you know, all this equipment out there, one piece, $150,000, one piece, $300,000, just for one piece of equipment, and and, and you have a little tractor with a plow. You can't compete, and and you can't... uh, do that in the environment so well, you understand. So large farming has taken over, and I'm not saying that's all good. I'm just saying that's what's happened. But I am saying that you can determine those large farmers didn't just become a large farmer. They made up a, uh, their mind, and they decided, and they purposed, I'm going to be a large farmer because I'm going to survive this economy, and I'm going to make it in this world, and I'm going to be a large farmer because I want to make some money and some resources for my family, and I want to make it in this business. So I'm going to be a large farmer. So they purpose, they do it, and what do they do? They, they accomplish it. And they help feed the world. Not just the United States, but they help, help feed the world. And they did it because they made up their mind. They purposed. They decided. So there is a heart decision, a mental decision, and a heart decision. Because we purpose in our heart to give. And we make up our mind we're going to be a large farmer. And so there are people that have done that. I, I preached a little bit just Sunday ago, uh, about different people that are household names in our world. People like Colgate. I still brush my teeth with Colgate toothpaste. Who tithe to God. People like, uh, you know, uh, Kraft. We still eat Kraft cheese. But these people tithe and gave. Kraft actually gave 25% of his income. 25%. 
So success didn't just happen. It happened because he believed in supporting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we could go on and on, and I won't repeat all of that, but I'm just saying there are people in our history, and there are people today. Green, David Green, who owns Hobby Lobby, he's a very generous man to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you, shop at Hobby Lobby. Support them. Why? I I don't shop there because my wife does. (laughs) That's not my interest, but... But I'm thankful for a good wife that does what she needs to do in that area. I do my part. I help her with the horses. All right. So, so, so we all have our part and our place, right? All right. So as a Christian, you can purpose in your heart to give. You can be a generous giver. And what happens when you do? Uh, God blesses you beyond what you could ever bless yourself. But these people that uh, started out, they started out, you know, Rockefeller. He said, I didn't tithe on, on my first paycheck. I would have never tithed on my first million. He said, if I didn't tithe on my first paycheck, and his first paycheck was $1.50. But he said, if I didn't tithe on that, I would have never tithed on my first million. First million. So, it's really about being faithful with what you have. Purposes, purposing in your heart to be faithful to tithe and faithful to give. And let God do what he has said he would do. Praise God. And so, there are just a few of people that have experienced ex- really phenomenal blessing in their life, but they did it by honoring God first with their tithe and their offering, and as a result, blessing came to their life, and in your life, blessing can come to your life because you choose to put God first, seek first the kingdom of God, and honor His house, honor His kingdom, and honor the purposes of God in the earth, and as a result, God said, I have found somebody that I can trust. And the next verse says, and God is able. God is able to make what? All grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Now, you are the person that did verse 6. And the person that did verse 7. That's who you, in verse 8, is talking to. The person that has sown generously, the person who has purpose in their heart to give, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loves a what kind of giver? A cheerful giver. You've chosen to be a cheerful giver who has purpose in your heart. And just the fact that you are purposed to do it and you're willing to do it, it says that you're cheerful in doing it. Praise God. You want to do this. It's not just something. You're not coerced to do it. You're not made to do it. No, God doesn't make anybody do it. He gives you an opportunity. Uh, You know, America is a land of opportunity. Uh, God has a place of opportunity and anybody can do it in America, they say, and anybody can, I believe, but anybody can do it in God's kingdom. Anybody can. Everybody won't, but somebody will, and you have to determine you're going to be one of those somebody that does, right? So he says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you so that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Think of that verse and the power of that verse and God's word and his promise to you. When you determine to be a sower and you determine to plant your seed and you determine to be generous in your sowing, you determine to be a generous giver, God says, I am going to make sure That something beyond what they could do on their own happens in their life. Hallelujah. The most important piece of equipment that a farmer has is his planter. A a big farmer, thousands of acres in in, in, uh, Colorado, he said, My most important piece of equipment on my farm is my planter. If I'm having a problem with my planter, 
I got to get it fixed or I got to get another one. Why? Because that's the most important piece. You can have the combines, you can have the harvesting tools, you can have the plows, you can have everything else, but if you don't have a planter, there is no harvest to harvest. That equipment is just going to sit there and rust. But if you have your planter operating, when harvest time, there's seed time, and there's harvest time, and there's a space in between. But if you're faithful to plant your seed and believe the Word of God in that interim time between the planting and the harvesting, make your confession bold and strong and hold fast to the confession of your faith that God will do what He said He would do. And God is able to make all grace abound toward me so that I always, think of it, always have all sufficiency. God's grace has done this for you. It's the grace of God that has blessed your life. It's the goodness of God in your life. It's something God has done beyond what you could ever do on your own. It's a bigger thing. It's something God stepped into. And God steps into your life and your financial life when you obey Him and you honor Him. You you tithe to him. You give to him. You believe his word enough to act upon it. God steps into your life and says, now I'm able to do exceeding abundant above what you ask or thought. And I'm able to make all grace abound toward you so that you always have all sufficiency. Everything is covered. Every need is met. Every need is supplied in a super abundant way. Always having all sufficiency. What in all things, everything is is covered always having not always lacking not always doing without not always wishing you had what somebody else had no always having all sufficiency in all things and then he winds the verse up and says and you're able to abound unto every good work. In other words, you are continuing in the process of giving. When you abound in generous giving, you will abound in a bountiful harvest. Hallelujah. A generous harvest comes to generous givers. So if you purpose to be a large giver, then you will be. It may not happen overnight, but you will be. Glory to God, because you made up your mind, you purpose in your heart. I'm going to put God first, hallelujah, and you tithe on the 150, $1.50, before you tithe on your first million, hallelujah. 